It's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Uh, they're doing uh, double duty since they gave the talk last week as well. Uh, Susan Wilhelm and Donna Lee uh, both became certified Arlington Alexandria Master Gardeners in 2017. And this is their fourth year teaching the principles of vegetable gardening in our urban agriculture series. They have been teaching both in person and virtually. They both love vegetable gardening, especially growing different varieties and trying new techniques, and of course, getting to eat what they've grown. In fact, Susan shared with us that her laptop is sitting on a bunch of cookbooks. <laughs> so I'm sure she makes good use of what she grows. Um, they'll share many of their own experiences and lessons learned. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Wilhelm. And as Colleen said, um, I and my co colleague, uh, Donna Lee, are both Extension Master Gardeners in Northern Virginia. And we're delighted to have you with us this morning. Collectively, parts one and part two of this presentation cover nine steps to creating your own vegetable garden. Last week, we covered steps one through four, and today we're going to cover steps five through eight. Nine, by planting your garden, watering, weeds, pests and diseases, and harvesting. Before we go into get started, let's talk a little bit about the Northern Virginia area where we garden. Just some few quick facts. We're in zone 7AB of the USDA plant hardiness map. That means our average minimum temperatures in the winter are somewhere between zero and 10 degrees. Our average last killing frost in the spring is in early April. And our average first killing frost in the fall is um, usually in the first couple of weeks of November. What that means is that this is a really wonderful place to do a vegetable garden because we have 180 days for growing. In our area, we can actually have three gardens, a spring garden, a summer garden, and a fall garden. Our average rain in this area is about 40 inches, although that can vary widely, and Donna will be talking about that more in the presentation. We also have a lot of clay soil in our area which means that gardeners in, in um, Northern Virginia are constantly adding organic material like compost to their soil in order to improve aeration, drainage, and water holding capacity. So step five is planting your garden. By the time you get to step five, you should already have your garden prepared um, with um, any amendments that were needed based on your soil test. And if you haven't done that already, you need to do that before you start the plant. The other things you wanna to do to get ready to plant are to review information on fertilizers and when to apply them for whatever you're gonna be growing. We've given you a really excellent um, reference at the bottom of the page um, because depending on the type of fertilizer you use and what the plants are you're growing, the um, requirements for fertilizing vary. And so you really do need to look them up. I also wanted to mention that last week we had a lot of questions about the use of manure. And Julie just sent you three really good links on the uses of manure in gardens, including what you can and can't use and the benefits of and pros and cons of each. You're also gonna wanna gather all your supplies. And that means you're gonna want to um, have your gloves, some kind of a digging or planting tool, a rake maybe to um, level your bed. And if you're a container garden, you're going to want to have your containers and your growing medium ready. Before you do anything more, you want to check the weather. Donna spoke extensively last week about how some plants like cool temperatures and some plants like warm temperatures. And you want to um, make sure that what you're plant that the weather is right for the things that you're planting. And we gave you a table in your handouts, which shows um, when you can generally plant what types of seed in our area. And you can use that 
Um, and I've used that for years with really good luck. But the most accurate way to um, know if the soil temperatures are correct for what you want to plant is to use a soil thermometer. And that is a thermometer with a metal tip that you stick into the ground. And you stick it in about 2.5 inches and for three or four days in a row so that you get consistent readings so that you know what your ground temperature um, for your plants is. And the way you use it is the best time of the day to, to take a temperature is between 10 and 11 in the morning. Soils tend to be cooler in the morning, warmer in the afternoon. That's a good average time during the day. If your schedule doesn't permit you to do that, you can also take a measurement in the morning and the afternoon and average um, those temperatures to find out what your uh, soil temperature is for moving forward. And we're going to talk a little bit more about soil temperatures later on in the presentation. Oh, one other thing that I meant, wanted to mention is check the long range forecast. Make sure there's not going to be a cold spell coming up within the next two weeks um, or some other activity, weather anomaly that might affect your garden. It's really critical not only to have the right temperature, but if you plant your bean seeds and it's too cold, they'll rot in the same way. Um, if, if it's too cold for tomatoes, um, you'll have problems with those as well. So um, make sure it's always better to be prepared for any future surprises that may come along. To get your bed ready to plant, the first thing you're gonna do is take a rake and just level the, the soil. This is for a traditional um, bed in the ground. Level the soil and break up any clods that might be remaining. And we recommend that beginner gardeners in particular plant their um, seeds in rows. And there's a lot of good reasons for planting in rows, but the one that I find most compelling is that it makes it much easier to distinguish your, the seedlings of your vegetables that are emerging from um, the seedlings of any weeds that may be around that are also emerging um, at the same time. And to plant your vegetables in a straight row, you put a stake on either side of the bed as shown in the photograph on the upper right hand side and you're on a string from one side to the other. And you're going to be planting under that string. Now we're gonna talk a little bit in the next slide about how deep to plant. But in general, at this point, if you're planting something shallow, um, you want to make a small indentation underneath the string to put your seeds in. And an easy way to do that is to lay a hole handle along the ground and rock it back and forth. That'll give you a small indentation. For seeds that will be planted at a deeper depth, you can use the point of a hole or a trowel and dig out furrow from one into the other at the proper depth. Another option is to actually lay the large seeds on top of the soil at the requisite spacing and push them in with your finger. And as a rule of thumb, even though I know we're talking about fingers, the space between the tip of your finger and your first knuckle is generally about an inch. So if you're planting something that needs to be planted at two inches, you'll be just sticking your finger down until the soil level is even with your second knuckle and that should be about right. There's a couple of terms that you'll run across when reading about planting seeds and they both have to do with how the seeds are spaced in the garden. The first one is drilling and drilling is the most common way of planting seeds and Drilling applies to placing the seeds in a row at even intervals. Um, hill, hilling is the other method. And when you do hilling, you're going to plant clusters of seeds. For example, hilling is often used with squash and cucumbers. You might plant four or five seeds in one spot, and then there might be um, 18 inches or even more space between that hill and the next hill. Hilling is often done in raised mounds of dirt, and those raised mounds of dirt work much like raised beds in that they warm up faster and that they have better drainage, and which are both really beneficial for squash or the other types of things where um, hilling is recommended. And on your seed packet, it should tell you 
um, which method is preferred for the seed that you are um, planting. Okay, spacing seed properly is really important. And the um, seed packet will generally tell you how far apart to um, place your seeds and whether or not um, hilling or drilling is the um, preferred way to plant. Um, small seeds sometimes um, are hard to put down individually and that can be made easier sometimes by mixing it with a little pulverized soil and then sprinkling it in the um, planting um, indentation that you've already made. The seed package will also tell you the proper depth. And if it doesn't, the rule of thumb is that you plant the seed at a depth that's twice the size of its diameter. After you plant the seed, you're going to pack the soil firmly around the top, over the top of the seed. And one thing to keep in mind is that some seed like lettuce needs light to germinate. So you don't wanna put excessive amounts of dirt over, just enough to um, cover that seed or to cover the seed to the proper depth for the planting. You're gonna water it lightly and um, you may want to at this point put some straw over your newly planted seeds. That'll prevent um, ground feeding birds like sparrows from going in and deciding to make a um, banquet out of your newly planted seeds. And I've had that happen to me more than once. So I highly recommend um, using the um, straw mulch. It's also really critical to keep the soil mo moist until the plants um, germinate. Um, almost all my crop failures have been, have been results of not keeping the soil moist enough. The top layer of soil in your garden will dry out way faster than you think it will. And so in some days you might even need to um, water twice to keep this um, soil um, damp enough for the plants to um, germinate. And a little note here, um, your seed packet will tell you how long it should be before the time that you put the seeds in the ground and when they're germinating. If you keep a journal like I do, um, or if you use little stakes that you can write on to mark your rows, jot down both the date of the, when you, um, germination is, plant, is expected, and also jot down the date that's on the packet for when you should expect to be able to harvest. You can monitor your seeds during that period when the, they're supposed to germinate. And if they haven't germinated by the time, say it's a 14 days maximum time, if it hasn't germinated in 14 days, you might wait a day or two just to see, maybe there's been a weather anomaly or something. But if the plants still don't come up, that means you've got a problem. You've either planted them too deep or you've not kept it wet enough and you're going to need to um, replant. Um, one other thing I wanna mention is that you will not plant every seed um, in your um, seed packet. Um, Dona ran into a situation once where somebody um, planted 300 carrot seeds from one package of seed in a garden bed that was about three, um, three foot by three foot square. She got a little germination, but uh, she didn't get any carrots. I mentioned soil temperatures um, earlier in the presentation, and this is an example of different types of vegetables and the temperatures at which the seeds germinate. You can see that there is a wide range um, some spinaches can germinate with temperatures as low as 35, even though they would prefer 45 or a little bit warmer. For other things like beans, um, they need a minimum temp soil temperature of around 60 degrees to um, germinate. Last year was the first year that I actually used a um, soil thermometer and I was um, blown away. Um, I was able to plant my green beans much earlier than I had anticipated and um, got in a real great first harvest um, before the Mexican bean beetles attacked, which was a, a secondary bonus. And um, you can get a soil thermometer at a hardware store, a garden center. You can even get a metal tip thermometer at an auto parts store. They use them for um, taking the temperatures in air conditioning ducts um, and they'll work too. And they might be a little less expensive. Another way to plant your seeds is using a seed tape. 
And you can purchase some seed already in a seed tape, or you can make your own. And this is a real fun thing to do with kids. Um, toilet paper or paper towels work best. And what you do is cut them in strips like you can see in the um, um, picture on the top of the screen. And you space glue evenly on the strip of paper at the, whatever intervals the seed package says. So if it's seed package says your beans are, your seeds need to be planted two inches apart, you put a dollop of glue every two inches and you use the, um, we've given you the recipe for the um, glue mixture to use and you plop your seed on it and it stays there. You then can um, put a little more glue along the edge of that tape and either place another strip on top of it or fold the strip over on itself to seal it. Uh, one tip, be sure to write on the um, seed tape what it is. Once you've got them all together and you've done several different things, you'll find that the seeds look all alike. And um, then what you do is you make an indentation in your soil to the proper depth and you just lay the tape in it and cover it up. It's really easy. Um, it's fast, and sometimes it can cut down on thinning. So thinning. There has to be enough space between your seeds for the plants to grow. And what you'll find is that the spacing on the seed package is generally um, has the seeds closer together than the plants you'll want to be in the long run. And the reason that they do that is not all seeds uh, may germinate. And so it's a precautionary um, measure. And um, carrots, radishes, beets, lettuce, and cucumbers are all examples of things that have to be thinned. And, and if you, um, and when you, when you thin, you thin using scissors. You don't pull the seedlings up because it'll disturb the roots um, that are next to um, in the plants that are next to them. And I will tell you that thinning is a really, really hard thing to do. You see all those seedlings come up and you're really excited and you're thinking about all the produce that you're gonna get, but you really have to thin because if you don't thin, the air circulation around the plants are not gonna be good, um, which can contribute to disease, or you may not get um, your harvest. One year, I left two beet seeds pretty close together and I thought, ah, I know they, they're right next to each other, but there's plenty of room on either side of the, bed, uh, the row where I planted, they'll be able to grow out into the row. Well, it didn't work that way. I got beautiful beet greens and when I pulled those two beet plants up, what I had were beets about the size of dime. And while I really like beet greens, I really wanted those beets. So um, please then. Okay, for some of the plants that you're gonna be putting in the garden are gonna be transplants. And what I'm talking about here applies generally to um, transplants that you've grown yourself. But that being said, when you purchase transplants, especially from someplace like a big box store or maybe even hardware store, it's still a good idea to um, harden those plants off too because you often don't know what their experience has been before you got them. And what hardening off means is that you're getting the plants accustomed to the climate and area that you're growing them in. Even if you grow um, transplants under lights in your house, that light is still not as intense as what the plants will be exposed to when you place them out in the garden. Um, they also have to get adjusted to outdoor temperatures and wind. And when you do it, you'll find, you can sometimes even see the stems getting a little thicker um, over the, the two week period it takes to harden off while they're outside. And the way that you do it is about one to two weeks before you're ready to plant, you take the seeds outside and you put them in a shady protected area. And every day you take them and bring them back it at night. Every day you take them out, you leave them a little longer and you gradually move them into a space where they're getting more sun and getting more exposed to uh, wind or other weather conditions. And by the end of about two weeks, um, they should be ready to go in the ground. And at the same time, if you're using um, transplants that you've grown yourself, you're gonna to wanna to decrease the watering during this period and uh, not fertilize. So to transfer plant, to put your transplants in the ground, it's best to do it on a cloudy day or in the evening if it's possible. If it's not possible, it's it's more important to get your plants in the ground than to hold on to them. So, you know, do what you have to do. About an hour before you're going to put them in the ground, you're going to water the plants 
and the containers that they're in lightly. And you're also gonna water the area that you're going to be planting in. It's really important to keep the roots moist um, at all times. Then what you're gonna do is um, you'll need to take the transplant out of the container. You'll have dug a hole in the soil slightly bigger than the transplant. And at about the same depth, when you put the transplant in the soil, you want the soil level of the growing medium to be the same level as the surrounding soil. Now, what I'm talking about is how you plant everything except tomatoes. There's a different process for planting tomatoes. And if you're gonna be a tomato grower, um, we have on our um, virtual classroom, which you have the link in your handout, there's a great um, program that Colleen and Donna did on growing tomatoes that goes into planting in quite detail. And you can check that out. Once you've placed the plant in the hole, you want to firm the soil around the plant and to water it lightly. Um, one thing I want to call your attention to is um, never to pick up a transplant by its stem. If you're having trouble getting out of the pot, you will want to use the leaves as shown, pick it up by the leaves um, as shown in the top photograph on this slide. And this is, if you have children that are helping you plant, just tell the children to reach for the leaves because most transplants that are broken in um, planting, that happens when someone grabs the stem. You may find um, if there's a sudden um, heat wave that you need to put some shading material over your plants, or if there's a cold spell that you may need to put some other type of protective material over your plants um, until they get settled and just keep that in mind. Once you've got your plants safely in the soil, the next step is to mulch. And mulch is a layer of organic material that you're gonna place on top of the soil. And it can be all kinds of things. It can be shredded pine or hardwood bark. It can be straw. It can be um, untreated composted grass clippings. It can be compost. And the reason that you use it is because it's another thing like compost that's a miracle. It's like a miracle drug in the garden. It reduces weeds, it conserves moisture, it can moderate soil temperatures, it can minimize soil erosion as it decomposes, it adds nutrients, and depending on what you use, it can also look terrific. You want to plant it, push it, um, put it on your soil um, around the plants, but make sure that the mulch, whatever you're using, does not touch the stems of your plants. Um, they'll rot if that happens. And at the bottom of this screen, we've given you some examples of some types of um, composting material or organic materials that could be um, used for your mulch. Residents of Arlington and Alexandria can get free mulch from the municipalities. And we've given you the links for both of these um, sites uh, if you want to do so. Um, they Both of them have both leaf mulch and um, a wood or a bark mulch. The um, leaf mulch usually comes from collecting leaves in the fall. The bark, bark mulch or tree mulch usually comes from recycled Christmas trees or trees that these municipalities um, have taken down. If you're thinking about, you can either dig this up yourself, go and take bags and collect it yourself, or you can have it delivered. And if you're having to delivered, you might want to take notice of the minimum size. Sometimes when I've had it delivered, I've actually shared an order with a neighbor because a single order was more than I could use. One other thing, in 2018, the Arling Arlington had its mulch evaluated by the U.S. Composting Council. And the U.S. Composting Council sets guidelines for what goes into the mulch, um, both in terms of what goes in, quality of it, and also how many, um, how much extraneous material can be in it. At that point, um, Arlington's mulch did meet the U.S. composting standards. Alexandria makes no claims for their compost. What you, you get is what it is, though I've used it, and I know many other people have used it uh, without having a problem. I mentioned earlier about um, gambling on the weather and looking at the long range weather forecast. The temptation is going to be, especially if there have been a few warm days in the spring, early April, the temptation is gonna to be to put things like tomatoes, peppers, basil in the ground too early. And when it works, it's great because you get your produce much earlier in the summer. 
The problem is, is that if it gets cold or if there's a late frost, uh, you could be in really tr trouble. But in the best case scenario, the plants will just hang out um, until the temperature's warm. But what can happen is while it's cooler, the plants struggle for nutrients and it might impact their growth later. So if you're a risk-taking person, you can um, go ahead and plant early, but be prepared, have some stuff ready so that you can um, protect your plants with a light sheet of paper or newspaper. If there's gonna be a sudden cold spell or a frost. A couple of years ago, we had a frost in um, early May and people had planted their gardens, they weren't prepared. And a lot of people lost all their transplants and had to start over again. Okay, is there any questions about um, planting seeds or transplants um, or mulch? Yes, there are, Susan. Um, if you are planting in a raised bed, can you alter the plant spacing? You can. There's a concept called square foot gardening where you divide your garden into um, square feet and then you plant within those and you would need to look at the resources online for how to do that. There's also something that's called intensive gardening where plants are put closer together. Um, I've not done that before. Um, Donna, can you speak to in that at all? Sure, um, yeah, I do that all the time. I'm sort of a, a fan of that in general. So um, I tend to not use the row spacing so much and I, I, I do block spacing. So if the spacing for beans is say uh, four inches between the seeds, um, once they germinated, I might do four inches along one direction and then I might do um, diagonally four inches in another direction, or maybe move, put the next like sort of row six over. So I have like sort of a mass of, of bean plants. Um, and I do that with like other things like um, radishes and, and stuff like that. But the stuff that's hard to see like lettuces because they look a lot like weeds when they germinate. Um, even I struggle with um, differentiating sometimes between the weeds and the, and the good seeds. And so I tend to do a little bit more in, um, some kind of a pattern that will will be obvious when they come up so that I know what to pull and what what not. So okay, yeah. great. Another uh, questioner had difficulty because their seed packets and the uh, the seed uh, company website didn't have enough information on germination or maturity. Do you all have a reference that you would give them if that's a problem? Well, they can certainly use the chart that we provided about with seed temperatures and germination temperatures. You can search online by putting at, searching for um, germination rates or germination temperatures and put site colon edu after it. And you'll get universities that will give you that you often have those types, that type of information. And you wanna pick the university that's closest to where you're actually gardening because that's probably gonna be the most relevant to what you're dealing with. Okay. Um, do you ever worry that mulch might have weed seeds? I have had, I use straw for my mulch and seed weed or seeds can be a problem with the straw. I've never had a really big problem with that. And I've just, you know, weeded it out the same way I've weeded everything else out. But that hasn't been a major problem um, for me. It is, would be a problem if you had compost, for example, that hadn't gotten hot enough to kill weed seeds, um, then it might be an issue. But you're gonna be in your garden weeding every day, probably anyway. At least weekly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone asked if that was plastic around the base of your tomato uh, slide, and is that advisable? It was plastic, and there are um, there is some evidence particularly using like a red colored plastic that it can help um, promote tomato growth. I personally don't use plastic because there's a disposal problem with it. You know, once you've got plastic, you use it once, you got to throw it away. And I'm just not willing, I prefer to use a more sustainable approach. Okay. Um, another person asked, they started seeds indoors in jars on wet paper towels and tried then planting them into small peat pots and they were doing poorly. Um, do you have advice for them? I've read that you're supposed to be able to do that. I've actually never done it. 
Um, I've done that to test seeds to see if they were viable before I planted them. The two, a couple of things to check. One is, um, do you have enough light? Seeds need a lot of light to grow. Um, the second thing is the temperature of your room. And the third would be, are you watering correctly? Okay, that makes sense. Um, could you talk about when, when's the best time to add supports for climbing plants such as peas? Do it at the time you put the um, pea seed in the garden. Okay. Um, are root vegetables uh, able to be transplanted or is it best to grow them as seeds? They're easy to grow as, as seeds, um, but you will see, like Dona mentioned, she's, and I, we've both seen transplants for beets. And in fact, the beets that I plant, they actually tell you, you can start them inside earlier. Um, I have read that carrots are not a good thing to use for transplants because they'll split. That being said, Dona was working with a children's garden and they wanted to um, plant seeds, carrot seeds that they had um, transplanted and they had no problem. So, you know, sometimes you just get lucky. Okay, that's always good. Um, do you have a good local source for straw that's free of herbicides? You know, that's a really good question. I get straw from a local nursery that I trust, but to be honest, I've never asked if there was an herbicide issue or not. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. That doesn't mean I couldn't have, but I don't. I haven't. <laughs> Here's a good one. Can you plant seeds past their expiration date? Well, <laughs> it depends on what kind of a risk taker you are. Um, seeds will last longer than one year, and there's all kinds of online resources that tell you um, how long you can keep them. I always plant my last year's seeds. Um, especially lettuces and stuff. I always plant everything early on just to see what comes up. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Okay. Kind of get two to four years for some seeds. I think um, lettuce and peas are not, don't last that long, but there's some seeds that will easily last for, and you could use the paper towel method to just test out the viability of some seeds, you know, in advance, just to make sure you're not, so you don't lose time perhaps. But I definitely don't throw out last year's seed or even the year before seed, I'll use seed that's a couple years old. And sometimes I just plant it thicker just to okay. be sure I get, I get what I need. Um, any tips on planting squash seeds uh, to prevent the onslaught of borers? Hmm. I know that you have to plant squash seeds in hills and my suggestion, I'm, I don't grow squash. Um, my suggestion would be when, at the end of this presentation, we're gonna give you some great online resources. That would be something that I would research before I plant it. I, we are gonna talk about squash bugs later, but not borers. Uh, let me, I do grow squash and I do struggle with squash borer. I have um, used row cover and uh, hoops when I planted the squash and kept it covered as long as I could um, until it, it needed pollination and was starting to flower. So I used, I, I've used low hoops to do that, but the problem is it gets, it can get big pretty quick. And then it actually, it was like Jesus coming from the, you know, the cave because it rolled off the row cover and, and it was no longer protected. So you would probably want to use the higher kind of, um, of electrical conduit hoops, but I've done that to keep it off. Otherwise, um, it's it's hard to squash, squash um, borer is a tough one. It's, it's frustrating, yeah. Okay. Um, someone is, uh, has asked a question about planting their seeds indoors under lights in small pods that they get from Lowe's or Home Depot. What's the next best place for those pods to go once they start to get bigger? Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna treat those pods just like you would if you had planted in, uh, say for example, a peat pot that could go right directly in the ground. And um, I've done that with some plants. Um, and what I actually tried to do was to cut the netting around the peat pot or around the little pot of 
um, growing medium off before I put it in the ground because that doesn't um, degenerate in the ground. It stays there around the roots of the plant, but you would harden off in exactly the same way and then plant with the le level of the um, growing medium equal to the level of the surrounding soil. And I'm really glad you asked that question because I wanted to flag one thing. Some people, and I do this too, I use peat pots for my seeds and you can plant the peat pot right in the ground when it's time to plant. You don't have to take the plant out. But one thing to be aware of, if the rim of the peat pot is sticking up above the soil level, you need to trim that off before you put it in the ground. If you plant it with the, the lip of the peat pot above the soil level, um, it acts like a wick and helps to, and it dries out the soil around the plant and you don't want that. Okay, I'm getting the sense, Susan, that there doesn't have to be an intermediate step between That's correct. that and the garden, is that correct? Well, there is, you still harden off. Okay. Just place the whole thing in the garden as, 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 as opposed to taking the um, um, plant out of the container in the case of a peat pot, or and you wouldn't do that if you were using one of those swell up pods. Okay. There was a question about watering seedlings, but I know you're going to talk about watering later. Should we leave that till then? Mm -hmm. okay. I'll cover that. I think we're good then. We can go on with the talk. Okay. So let's talk about water and watering properly. Let me let me talk about the um, the uh, seeds that you're growing inside for transplants. Um, key to that typically is I I, water, I try to water from the bottom. I try to make sure that I don't let them get too soggy. Um, you can overwater and they can um, easily get um, mold and mildew. I also try to make sure I, I have a small fan that actually has a USB plug and I plug it into a little um, power supply and I, I face it on my uh, plants to kind of help keep the airflow. And, and that way, if it's, if it's a little bit wet, it'll um, help keep, um, help dry out so there's no like mold and mildew. Occasionally, I'll, um, I'll water at the surface carefully, but I never like spray the top of the seedlings that I'm, I'm growing and I never let them um, sit in water. You definitely don't want them to sit in water. You wanna, you wanna um, water them, but not, not soak them and not keep them drenched at all. Um, you're better off watering less than more for other seedlings. So let's talk about watering in your garden and your containers. Um, we talked a little bit before about um, how much, how much water we get a year in this area. So here's the, um, the macro view of historical rainfall in, in Northern Virginia. Um, and if you go to that link down there at, at the bottom, weather underground, for your area, if you're outside of this area, you could actually put in information for your area and get similar, similar data. Um, so here's a total um, annual rainfall by year. So this is January to December. And so what's recommended in the garden is that the garden gets about an inch of rain a week. So that's, um, 52 inches, and so that's the blue, the first stone um, bar. The next bar is what's the 40, that's the 40 year average for the Northern Virginia area, and it's 39. So clearly between the two, there's a, um, a discrepancy. And so that just tells you we're gonna have to um, probably water at some point during the year, because we're not gonna get enough. But then you look at the following four years, actual data. So 2018, we had this high of 64 inches for the year and we broke records. Then the next year, 2019, it went back down more towards the average. So clearly you probably have had to water a little bit. But then you go back to 2020 and again, you see 57 inches. That's, that's a high, it's more than what we need. And then in 2021, it kind of went down again. So clearly you have to um, pay attention to what's going on. So here's the macro view. And I looked at this and I thought, it doesn't really tell you everything. What you really need to know is what's happening on, at the very least, a monthly basis. And what really you want to start to know is what's happening on a weekly basis. So I took the data from the previous chart and now I'm plotting it for the growing season here in Virginia. So from April to October. And so you can see the one uh, straight line in, um, uh, in blue, this one right here, this uh, sort of cornflower blue color, that's, that's the recommended. And then you look below, you see this orange, it's not quite um, straight, that's the average for uh, 40 years. And you can see it's below the four, so you can even see that Clearly in May and June, it, it, you were gonna to have to rain based on the average predictions. But now we go to 2018 and that's the green. So 2018 was just a, a crazy year. We had a lot of rain. When you wanted like four inches, we were getting seven. Oh, and over here we were getting 10. And so we're getting way more rain than we needed. And because we have this clay soil, um, we have a problem with the, with the rain sitting. 
And sometimes it could sit underneath the bed at the level of like where the clay is sort of solid, like you've worked the top and you're sort of breaking it up and you're improving it, but there's still this base underneath. So sometimes you have water sitting there. Um, then if you look at um, 2021, that was the red line. So, you know, we, we had some rain in, in June, then it went kind of low, so we watered a little bit. And then we had this crazy um, July, August, where I think we got six inches of rain in one week. So it looks like August got eight inches and you say, yeah, that's not so bad. Yeah, but we got six inches of it in a week. So that's where things like the rain gauge, okay, comes in handy. And what, what I've learned is the moisture meter. Now I'm not saying as a new gardener, you have to go and buy these things. You can put a can, you could take a tuna fish can or any kind of a can and take the top off and leave it in your garden so that when you go out, you can see what kind of rain we got. Because the other thing that happens is my garden is, um, oh, it's about four miles from my house. And so I'll go out and I have a rain gauge at my house too now, they're four bucks. So I put, I look and I see, I got like a quarter inch of rain. Okay, so we didn't get much of the garden then. I go to the garden and we got an inch and literally it's four miles away. And so it's sort of this microclimate kind of idea. So let's look at the basics then of watering. I mean, that's just data that, that kind of helps you start to understand why some of the things are happening that are happening in your garden. And why are some things maybe not doing so well? So you want an inch per week. And that's will wet the soil five to six inches deep. Um, and so if you have containers outside, they're going to get wet and, and hopefully they have drainage in them. And if you're not sure, again, you could use the uh, soil thermometer in those. And it, it pretty much has a, um, it has a scale that shows you dry is red, um, moist is blue, and wet is, um, uh, or actually uh, moist is green and wet is, uh, is blue. So if it's all the way over wet, you don't want to do anything. And, and you may not be able to, you know, you may not be able to do anything. You just hope that if you know that you have these problems in your soil, that you're um, uh, planting um, appropriately. And we'll talk about that. So you don't want to base the watering on, on how the crop looks or what the soil surface is, because as Susan said, the soil surface at the very surface will dry out and it can look kind of crumbly. But if you stick your finger in, say you don't have a gauge, this is what I used to do. You stick your finger in down, you know, up to the second or maybe even the third knuckle, it's moist down there. And if I've been watering properly, I'm allowing the roots to grow deep and not just stay shallow on the surface. And so I don't need to water. I might want to, I might really want to, but, but I shouldn't water because I really don't need to. So I, I use the rain gauge to kind of track what's going on. And I use the moisture meter um, because what I found last year, we had a food bank garden and everybody, we gave people assignments to water and so they'd go and they'd look and they'd water. And things were just looking poorly. You could tell like they were looking like green and they were kind of getting droopy and they weren't doing well. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. And finally I got the, the, the meter and I checked. I was like, we were soaking this thing. And when we had that six inches of rain, it looked like a rice paddy in the garden because the water was just sitting on the surface. And by the end of the day, it finally started to soak down into the ground, but you know that it was sitting down there underneath the roots and it was gonna take a while for it to, 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 to go down. The other thing is you wanna match um, what you're doing with watering to the plant needs and the growth phase the plants are in. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna water plants at the base and you wanna soak the roots. You don't wanna do the overhead spraying. It's, you really don't wanna use a sprinkler. Um, I like to get the kind of um, head for my hose. It has, has a soaker um, option on it um, so that I can actually lay it down at the ground and I can go do other chores while I'm, while I'm while I'm waiting to water. So I, I go weed and I harvest and I, I plant. Well, and I, you know, sometimes I set a timer and I move my the hose around um, from tomato plant to tomato plant or from section of one of my beds to another section. If you can water in the morning, that's great. If you work and you can't get out in the morning and try to get there, um, you know, as early as you can in the, um, in, in the evening or, or late afternoon, because that way it gives the plants a little bit of a chance to, to dry out and can prevent some of the, the fungal kind of soil borne diseases that you'll get. Definitely water less often, but deeper and longer to get good root development, which is good. That means you don't have to go out to your garden to water lots of days. You might only have to go out once a week and just water and take a little bit more time. You see people all the time, you know, with a hose and they're spraying and they're spraying and they spend like 15 minutes and they're done and they come back the next day. And they, that's not how you, you need to do it. You just need to do it really good and less often. And the other thing that's important is you want to stay out of your garden beds when the soil is wet because you just compact uh, the soil. And if there are any kind of diseases, you're going to spread it around. So we talk about watering during the, um, <clears throat> the critical phases. It's kind of common sense if you think about it. If you look at the broccoli and the cabbage and the cauliflower, 
when the head of the plant is developing, <clears throat> that's when it's going to need more water to do what it needs to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Same with beans and peas. As the pot is filling out, that's an important time for it to uh, get water. Look at cucumber when they're flowering and then the cucumber itself is developing. Matter of fact, cucumbers will be bitter if they don't get enough water during the point that the, um, the fruit on the plant is actually developing and filling out. And then with eggplant and tomatoes um, and, and peppers, you want to, um, as it's flowering and then starting to fruit, that's an important um, time for them to get water as well. And of course, lettuce um, in terms of as if the head, even if it's loose leaf, as that's developing, they need some moisture there. Um, so that can help a little bit in terms of um, paying attention to what's going on in your garden for the specific things that you've grown. Okay, I'm gonna take questions after this next phase. Okay, so let's go on into weeds. So the Webster, Webster says a weed's a plant that's not valued where it's growing and it has vigorous growth and especially one that tends to overgrow or choke out more uh, desirable plants. And so, you know, there's three key parts of this, that's the idea of value. And so when I show you some of the weeds, um, some people will recognize some of these weeds as things that people actually eat so to them or, to, or they realize that to some people, it's not a weed like dandelion greens to some people is, is not a weed. Um, but to other people it might be. Or, um, you know, I had butternut squash that popped up as a volunteer in my garden and it overgrew my cucumbers. Now I could say that was a weed because it, it choked out something that was desirable to me. But in the end, I decided that the butternut squash was pretty good. And so I kind of let it go because it was so vigorous. It apparently um, deserved to be there more than the cucumber. But in general, you know, when we talk about weeds, you know, we're talking about, um, things like um, crab grasses, and, and, and you'll see in a minute. But the thing to keep in mind about weeds is they have evolved over time to, to be sometimes um, just so strong that they have dug up and found weed seeds that are thousands of years old, and they will still be viable and grow and exposed to water and light, which is, is, is crazy amazing. So the tips for weed control, um, is you want to know what the weed is. And I'm going to show you my, my uh, dirty dozen next. And you want to learn about its life cycle because you'll learn that some go to flower in the spring and then they're going to go to seed um, while others may um, flower uh, later in the, in the fall or in, in late summer. And what you want to do is you want to minimize the soil disturbance because if you dig and you cultivate and you have let your weeds go to seed, you won't, don't want to bring them to the surface that then they'll germinate. So if you can keep them um, you know, under the soil, that's fine. Um, Big thing with pulling weeds is you want to do it when the soil is moist and you really want to make sure that you get the roots. So you want to get your fingers down to the bottom and you want to pull up. Or I sometimes use a, um, a garden fork to kind of loosen up a chunk of dirt and then I'll pull the seed, the weeds out. And I'll dispose of them. If it's just greens, you could put them in your compost. Um, if there's seeds on them or flowers going to seed, you want to actually put them in the trash. And then you want this whole idea of prevention. You want to cover any bare soil <clears throat> with mulch or ground covers or cover crop, and we'll talk about that. Any bare soil is an invitation for weeds to move in. So I was just at the garden two days ago and, and one of our um, gardeners there, um, we helped her out by covering um, her bed with um, pla black plastic, um, which isn't my favorite way to cover, but that's what we ended up having and we used to keep the weeds from coming in after she had put some compost down. But there was one section of her bed that had a lot of perennials and stuff. And so we couldn't really cover it with plastic like we did. And when I was over there on, on, um, on Wednesday, I saw that that section was covered in and all around the, her permanent plants with um, weeds that had already started to come in because we've had this great weather the last week or so. And that's an example to me of a spot where we should have got some straw down or we should have gotten some uh, leaf mulch or something like that down and, and we didn't do it. So she's gonna have this one section where she's gonna have to weed. Um, I like to weed walkways, unless you're growing grass there and keeping it cut. I like to dig deep, get rid of the roots, cover it with some kind of newspaper or cardboard and then wood chips. And that will, that will take care of most of the work you'll have to do all season if you, if you do it and you, and you do it well. So here's the um, sort of the dirty dozen. Um, I literally went around and um, identified all the weeds I could find in, in the community garden that I'm in, in Alexandria. And then I went out and got some good pictures for you so that you could actually um, um, identify them. Now we said some are edible like the purslane and the, and the lamb's quarter and um, even the plantain in the bottom row <clears throat> are often um, edible. Uh, the dandelion greens are, are considered edible. 
Um, everybody's got Bermuda grass. So, so some things um, dispersed by seed, some have rhizomes or underground roots, and they are really good at, at spreading. Um, wild garlic can be um, edible. You just have to make sure that it's truly wild garlic because there are some um, plants that are um, not good to eat that look a little bit like wild garlic. So you wanna make sure you know what you're um, eating. Um, but I guarantee you in the next couple of weeks, you're gonna see um, patches of speedwell. You're gonna see, I was looking out in our common area in our townhouse complex and I'm seeing Creeping Charlie, which is the, um, on the left side in the middle, it's considered a ground ivy. It's easy to see because even if the flowers aren't, aren't on it yet, it's got a square stem. But if you reach down right by the root and if it's been, been a little bit wet, not totally dry, it'll come right out and it won't come back if you get that whole piece of it out. Things like uh, Canadian thistle and, and plantain, they have a taproot as does dandelion. And so you'll have to get deep to get the whole taproot. So you might have to use more of a, a trowel or a shovel depending on how big you let it get. If you get them when they're small, they come out really easily um, just by hand. It's worth the effort. Um, it's a little bit of a project, but if you take care of it and then you cover up um, with some kind of a mulch, um, you'll make the rest of your season uh, much easier. Best thing though, don't let it go to seed, like that hairy bittercress in the, in the top left. Um, if you just let that go to seed and you just go like this with your finger, you'll see hundreds of tiny, tiny seeds going everywhere and you've just spread it. So just at least cut it off, even if you don't have time to, um, to weed, cut the, cut the heads off so that the flowers don't go to seed and that'll at least save you some work later on. So here's a couple of um, websites that are really handy. Um, if you're not sure about a weed and you wanna find out more about it and how it grows and a little bit more about um, the season of the weed and, and when, when to look out for it, um, these are great ones. So I suggest these. So I'll take questions. Um, we're shy on many questions. Someone asked if you ever plant vegetables in a flower bed or in the house strip. I totally do. Both. Yes. <laughs> I have. Um, do you have any hints for how they should go about that? Um, well, you just need to find a spot where there's space. Things like um, kale, um, Swiss chard do really well. Um, even lettuces do really well in and among flowers. Um, I've grown pepper plants. Um, they're smaller varieties. Um, tomatoes could be a little, it depends upon, um, you know, what you and your neighbors are comfortable with. Because some things might need um, structure to, to support them. Like a, a tomato typically needs a cage and a cage in a flower bed that might be right in the front might not be um, as desirable as maybe if you could do a, I've done some pepper plants on a, on a simple stake and tied them up to keep them up as they got heavy with fruit. Um, but any of those things, basil um, is, is fine in a, um, in a flower bed. Um, yeah, I just find little spots and you just kind of go for it. Um, yeah, should do really well. Yeah. Um, Donna, do you have a favorite soaker hose system you would recommend? <clears throat> I, I don't use a soaker hose. I just have a, a handle that has a... Um, it has like eight different like um, spray patterns and I just make sure that it has a spray pattern. I look at them all and I go on like Amazon or something because they, oh, not, they don't all have it. And I just make sure I find one that has a soaker, um, a soaker option as one of the patterns. Um, I can't tell you the uh, source. I don't, because I'm in a community garden, I don't have a way to permanently keep a soaker hose in place. Um, so I, I can't do that. So I can't do an irrigation thing like that. Susan, do you use a soaker hose? I don't use a soaker hose, but I saw a um, the University of Maryland extension has a piece about hoses and soaker hoses that I thought was pretty good. They show they showed um, laying it out in a raised garden bed, but they had a lot of good tips. The secret with a soaker hose is that it needs a different water pressure. The water pressure that comes out of your faucet is too high, and so. Um, there are some tricks to making sure that the water actually gets to the whole end of the hose. But anyway, check out that University of Maryland um, link and it might be a good place to start. Okay, thanks. Um, someone asked a question about, should we leave weeds to flower to attract pollinators right now while things aren't growing or should they be pulled before they flower and go to seed? I mean, what are well, the payoffs? Flowers are okay, you just have to, make sure you get them before they go to seed because 
you can end up having them starting to seed while they're still flowering. And um, it's really not worth it to let them go to seed and produce more weeds for you. Um, there's things you can plant in terms of, um, I'm trying to think of some flowers. Like I, I'm, I'm growing some alyssum as an early flower and some uh, bachelor button for an early springish flower. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let them go too long because they're just getting more and more vigorous and they're going to be harder and harder to pull out when you're ready to pull them out. Don't let them um, settle in like that. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, someone just weeded a garden but isn't ready to plant yet. Um, should they put a row cover over it or what should they do? Put something over it. You can put, if you have row cover, put row cover down and cover it. It'll at least keep the seeds from landing and germinating and it'll still let water go through. You can use um, black plastic. Um, you can use, I guess you could use some of that landscape fabric. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend, or even straw. I mean, I do buy the straw from like the, the nursery and you know, put a layer of straw on because then later when you're ready to plant, you can pull it back and then you'll, you'll, um, put it back in place around the plants. So that's, that's a good thing to do too. And a bale of straws, I don't know what, 10 or 15 bucks max for a big bale. Okay. And it'll cover it. It'll cover a 20 by 20 garden, I think. So, or you can share it with somebody if you don't have that much space. Yeah. Um, someone asked about the best trellis for cucumbers. They've had the experience of um, their cucumber plants starting to die once they start climbing and they're worried about their trellis, if that's the factor. It's probably a disease or pest. I've had that happen. I've had beautiful things on my trellis and then all of a sudden um, there's a couple of insects that um, spread some of the um, diseases. Maybe we should get into that section. It's, it's not the trellis. It's okay. not the trellis. Do you have a recommended trellis? I make my own out of bamboo, I'm cheap. <laughs> so I, I sort of make structures and, and um, I can get bamboo for free and, and, I, and I put it in the ground and, and kind of make cross hatches and yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of nice ones though that are inexpensive, you know, yeah. any, of the, any of the garden stores that you get seeds from sell so things that will last year to year, like kind of, you know, triangular ones like this or more cheapy ones, but yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite way of dealing with chickweed? Um, I, I do everything by hand. I mean, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I identify it. I loosen it up so I can pull it and I pull it. I don't know. I don't spray any, I don't spray any, um, any chemicals on my weeds. I haven't needed to. I found that if I do mechanical labor and, and prevention, um, it takes care of things for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone asked um, about planting watercress. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, watercress, just to plant it as a vegetable? Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say. I, I haven't actually planted it. We tried planting cress when you're in the kid's garden. Um, it seemed like it was a little tricky to get it to germinate. Um, I would just have to look at the package and, and, and sort of try. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> for carrots, because they're such a tiny seed and sometimes we get rain and it washes them around, I have had some success with um, covering it with burlap and keeping an eye out. And as soon as it starts to germinate, I uncover it just because I find the seeds, if we have rain or whatever, get kind of like washed around a little bit and you sort of lose them. So you could try that, like damp burlap. But don't let it go too long because then it'll get caught up in the burlap. And when you um, go to pull it off, you know, it gets caught and you might pull it out. But it, they might try that if the problem is germination. Okay, Donna, someone asked if you could put the resources slide, the one right before the questions back up on the screen. Uh, sure, I can. Okay. This is also in the, uh, there's a resources two page document that we sent out in PDF um, as part of all the handouts. And, I think every single link that we provide in the presentation is listed um, in that two pager so that you have it all in one place. Okay. And finally, this one is kind of interesting. This person says, I've always watered at the base, but as I was thinking about how to be more natural in my garden, I thought about rain and rain gets the leaves wet. Why is it bad for us to wet the leaves if nature does it that way? 
Good point. <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, the problem is you want the leaves to dry. And if you're watering on your own and you can keep the leaves dry by watering at the base, that's good. If you're not spraying, you're keeping, um, and you have mulch down, you're keeping um, soil borne diseases from spraying up on the plant. Now, of course, yeah, if you didn't have any of that cover and it's raining, it's just gonna happen. But, you know, just, this is practical experience from horticulturists <laughs> at our um, extension, yeah. Okay, um, I think that's it for questions for this section. All right, you got it. Okay. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about controlling pests and diseases. And the, good, the most important thing to know about pests and diseases is that there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent them from occurring. You can't eliminate them, but you can delay them or you can sometimes avoid them. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about, like proper watering, spacing plants for good air, air circulation, are part of the prevention package. They're, they're some of the best tools that the gardener has to avoid both bugs and disease. Um, if, and these include other things like when you purchase plants, um, transplants, checking to make sure that there are no bugs or diseases on the plant. Um, white fly is often brought into gardens um, on um, plants that have been um, purchased from um, garden sources. If you mix flowers and herbs together, I mean, flowers and herbs and vegetables all together in your garden, you um, not only attract beneficial insects from the, um, the flowers, but there's emerging research that says that sometimes the scent of the flowers can confuse bugs and they can't find the host plant that they're looking for. You have to think of gardens as like their own little ecological system. And the more diversity you have in it, better, the healthier the garden's going to be um, overall. Um, in addition, you're going to need to constantly monitor your plants so that you can identify any problem, be it a pest or a disease early, because the earlier, you identify it, the more resources you have for dealing with it and you can keep it from becoming a major problem. So in order to know whether you've got a problem or not, you're monitoring, you need to know what to look for. So what we're gonna do in the next couple of slides is introduce you to some common um, pests that you often see on commonly grown vegetables in gardens in the Northern Virginia area. I'm gonna go just lightly over them, maybe suggest one or two ways for easily handling them. And then we're gonna talk about additional resources that you can use at the end. But the main message here is that you need to know what you're looking for because you have to know what the bug is in order to decide how to deal with it. And let's start with, um, bean beetles. You'll find bean beetles on the underside of your bean leaves. And if you look at the picture on the left, we've shown you photographs of the um, bean beetle in all of its stages of development. And sometimes when they're really active, you can find the bean beetles in all of these different stages of development um, in a single row of beans. If you find the eggs, you just squash them, you know, hold, either take the leaf off and dispose of it or um, squash it, fold it in half and squash the eggs. And you've already um, set the um, population of bean beetles back. For the bigger beetles, you can hand pick them. Um, and, but if you don't like to really touch bugs, you can also knock them into a container of um, soapy water. And one word I'll just say is that you may think you're squeamish, but when it comes to between you, your produce and your bug, you may find that you're not as squeamish as you thought you were. Um, the picture on the right shows um, damage um, from the bean beetle. So if you see this on your um, bean plants, you know you've got a problem. Harlequin bugs are another bug that are easy to hand pick or to knock into soapy water. And you'll see them on broccoli, cabbage, kale, occasionally um, other vegetables. And again, we've shown you them at three stages, four stages of development, because you could find them at any one of those. And the earlier you get them, the better. 
we were talking about squash borer later. Squash bug is um, a real problematic thing. And again, you can see from the eggs all the way through development to the final um, bug. And squash eggs, the seeds for the squash seeds, the eggs for the squash bug, they're difficult to squash. So if you find those on your squash leaf, you wanna actually remove the leaf from the plant. With regard to the nymph, I saw a really cool picture um, on a University of Maryland website where they took duct tape, wrapped it around their knuckles with the sticky side out, and then put that close to the leaf and the um, nymphs stuck to the duct tape, and then they just pulled their hand away. Obviously, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna to have to be really careful that you don't get the duct tape on the plant leaf, but um, it was an intriguing idea that I thought might be worth trying. The um, adult bugs, um, you can hand pick, but sometimes they can be hard to um, find. I have told you that I don't grow squash, but I've read that you can lay a board on the ground near your squash plants, similar to like what you might do to get a slug, and that the squash, the adult squash bugs will go under the board. And if you lift the board in the morning, you can pick the adult um, squash bugs off and um, dispose of them. See if there's anything else I wanna say about squash bugs. Oh, one other thing about squash. There was a study done by the University of Iowa a couple of years ago where they interplanted their squash plants with nasturtiums. And they found that by interplanting nasturtiums and squash plants that you um, had fewer squash bugs and much less squash damage to the squash plants. Now, I don't know if that's gonna work in your own garden because obviously we can't replicate the conditions of whatever the Iowa test fields were, but it might be worth trying. And at a minimum, it should look pretty cool to have the alternating um, plants in your garden. Okay, next are the striped and spotted cucumber beetles. And these are um, things that you really want to be, say, keep away from or keep a control in your garden to the extent possible. Um, the striped cucumber beetle you find primarily on um, cucumbers and other cucurbits. And the spotted cucumber beetle you see on a much wider range of hosts. And these guys are problematic for a couple of reasons. One is that they eat almost every part of a plant during their growth cycle. But the other one is that the um, striped beetle in particular um, transmits um, a disease called bacterial wilt. And when your cucumbers get bacterial wilt, they'll all of a sudden just collapse on you and they'll be dead. So you want to avoid that. And one way to avoid that is by avoiding the, um, the pests. Now, the cool thing about growing cucumbers is that if you plant them late, I think this year it's like after June 15th, the um, cucumber beetles will have already um, cupated, grown up, turned into bugs, had nothing to eat and will die. So you can actually avoid a big problem with these cucumber beetles just simply by the way or the timing of your planting. Another thing to keep in mind when you're monitoring your garden is you want to attract beneficial pests. And this is another reason that you really need to know what you're looking at. If you look at this picture on the top of the lady beetle eggs, you can see they're kind of yellow and oval shaped. Well, and they're clustered close together, but if you go back and look at some of these other pictures, here the, the spotted cucumber beetle is oval, but it's more spread out. Um, squash bug is red, um, bean beetle is yellow and small. You wanna know the difference because you don't wanna get rid of the eggs of the um, lady beetles because they're gonna eat aphids, they're gonna eat small insects, and you want as many of those in the garden as you possibly can get. The parasitoid wasps um, are the wasps that you wanna have because they're the ones that eat tomato hornworms. They lay their eggs in the caterpillars and the caterpillars are the, as the eggs develop inside the caterpillar, they eat the hornworms from the inside out. It's kind of disgusting when you think about it, but if you see a uh, tomato hornworm that has those little white egg sacs on the top, don't take it out of your garden because the bugs will take care of it. And you want to support them in, in going after any other um, hornworm that you didn't see. Another cool um, beneficial insect is the hoverfly. And it looks like a bee. Um, and the way you can tell the hoverfly from a bee is that the hoverfly only has um, two wings. 
where bees and flies have four. We I mentioned it before, I wanted this um, introduction to these different pests that we give you some resources. And one really handy resource is the Integrated Pest Management Guide. We've given here, you here the links for both the Maryland and the Virginia Integrated Pest Management Guide, as well as a link to a, an additional resource that I'll talk about um, later on um, our Master Gardener website. And what you do with the integrated um, pest management guide is you look up your bug and you can see in the green column on the left, we've got a list of bugs. It'll tell you what the first line of treatment is, what it, that is, what you can do that'll be the least invasive. And you always want to do the least invasive thing first because you're going to be eating what comes out of your garden. And then it gives you what you need to do for the last resort in the last column. And you'll see, for example, for aphids, one of the first things it says is using insecticidal soap. And after that, it says 2-8. Um, 2-8 is actually the page number. Um, it's in section two, page eight of the um, Integrated Pest Management Guide. You can see for cucumber beetles, they talk about hand picking, um, planting after June 15th, um, and using row cover crops to um, exclude beetles. And I forgot to mention that when I was talking about that earlier. Anyway, these are two really, um, this is a really handy resource for you to, um, to use to find out what's going on. We've also got on our website, um, the monthly beating the bugs guides. This starts in February with things that you can do proactively to keep pests from proliferating in your garden all the way through November with things you can do in the fall to get your garden ready for next year. Um, and then by each month it talks about the pests you might see and it provides um, ways to um, address them. Personally, I would recommend dealing with what you've got in one month and reading ahead so that you know what to anticipate in the future. Okay, rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, voles and voles, um, snakes, and sometimes even humans and their pests can be potential um, issues that you have to deal with in your garden. And the good news about this is that there is on our website a wonderful presentation called Living with Wildlife Without Losing Your Garden. And it goes through all these different types of um, animals that you might run into your garden and tells you what to do about it. I mentioned earlier about putting down straw over newly um, planted seeds to protect them from ground eating birds. Um, you can put a water feature or a uh, bird bath near your garden area to attract birds like cat birds or um, blue jays and crows that might take a peck out of your tomato if they're looking for moisture. Um, when it comes to four-legged creatures like deer and um, rabbits, the really only way that you can be positive that they're not gonna impact your garden is either through a fence or some other type of protection like a row cover where the deer or the rabbit or whatever it is cannot get to your plant. Um, some people will try to install rotate and scare devices. Um, they work for a while, but eventually the deer learn what they are and they um, don't, aren't scared anymore. Um, and you might also see um, in references to deer resistant plants, things like rhubarb, maybe some heavily spiced herbs like lavender. Some people think deer won't um, bother those. And, but here's what the real, the bottom line is. There's no such thing as a deer proof plant. What there are, are there are some plants that some deer will not eat some of the time. And the problem is you don't know what your deer's preference is gonna be. If you're gonna be one of the ones that leaves it alone or if it's um, going to eat it. And even if adult deer doesn't eat it, sometimes their kids will take a chomp out of something cause they don't know any better. So sure, it's worth trying, but know that if you really wanna keep um, deer and rabbit out of your garden, you're going to need a fence. And with rabbit fence in particular, it has to be um, buried um, up to six inches in the ground because rabbits could um, dig under a fence that in, in um, on the surface of the soil. Disease like pests are something that you want, to, you need to know how to identify because you need to know what it is in order to know what to do. And here are some examples of some things that you might see in your garden. On the right-hand side, we've got some things that affect tomatoes, um, Fusarium wilt and crown rot, 
the early and late blights. And at the bottom left, the septoria leaf spot is also a pest or a disease that you may see um, on tomatoes. Um, downy mildew and powdery mildew are two different kinds of mildew that you may see on your um, plants. And powdery mildew is sometimes seen on peas, beans. You can see it on okra and cucumbers. Um, the downy mildew is also uh, seen on cucumbers and you can also see that as squash. And as I said, the main, the first thing in knowing how to deal with these is to um, make sure you properly identify them. We've given you a link here to a plant problem image where you can look up photographs of these things to try to identify what they are. If you're still confused and you um, live in the Northern Virginia area, you can reach out to our help desk and they'll help you um, identify these um, plants. There are things that you can do to help avoid some diseases. And one of the things is um, to buy disease resistant varieties. And this is a slide that shows you about tomatoes and the different letters that you'll see after their name that will tell you whether they're resistant to a common tomato disease. You know, like V is for particulate wilt, N is a new rod, root, not nematode. Again, with disease resistant varieties, that means that that doesn't mean that they won't get the disease, but that you that they may get it, if they're gonna get it, they'll get it later in the season, or they may get it in a small enough, be able to re retain it in a small enough area that it doesn't do any damage to your fruit and you can still harvest. Again, with diseases like pests, all the common sense things that you do, the good best management practice we've been talking about, like watering and proper spacing can go a long way to um, holding disease at bay. And with regard to um, tomatoes or other um, disease resistant plants, there's a lot of online resources at universities where you can look up a plant if you're um, concerned about whether it's disease resistant or not. I found um, one on Cornell University's website where they list a couple hundred tomatoes and the diseases that they're resistant to, which could be very handy. Um, so you might want to have that idea in mind when you're looking for your um, tomato seeds or plants. Um, you can get um, other support from these websites, and again, these are all on your handout as well. Um, there are places that you can look at pictures of garden diseases, garden pests, um, to help you determine what your issue is. Because again, I can't emphasize this enough, you have to know what the problem is before you can know um, what the solution is. And this is um, some samples from the Virginia Tech website about um, diseases that you might find um, on squash or tomatoes. And one thing that you might want to do, in addition to the other resources that we've talked about, is if you know you're going to go to grow squash, go online, look at a couple resources like this. Um, you can find these things at other extension universities as well. And look at what they suggest for cultural controls. Look at their photographs. The more that you know about um, the plant that you're growing, the more you'll be able to um, recognize problems when they occur. And, and deal with them. Any questions about pests or diseases? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have any thoughts on someone who's having trouble with their eggplant leaves being chewed early in the spring and not so much later on in the growing season and what they should do about it? I'm gonna to have to tell you to look online. I, my memory is that you need to plant eggplants later in the season. I know I've had trouble with flea beetles on eggplant. And I think that's one that if you plant a little later in the season, it might help. But to be honest, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have recommendations for interplanting with squash um, to prevent? Well, we, we talked about the nasturtiums and squash. Okay planning. There's actually a really terrific book um, that was recently, um, I think it was put out last week and it won the American Horticultural Award. It was on companion planting. And what it is, is a summary of all the scientific research that supports the um, planting of different types of plants together um, in terms of how they benefit each other. 
And that's a really good resource. You can find it at the library probably. Okay, great. Um, does it matter what time of day you check for pests? That's a really good question. <laughs> I usually check in the morning first thing, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but I would say you check when you have time to check. Right, right. Um, someone wondered what uh, places like Meadows Farms that guarantee that they'll keep deer away use uh, to keep deer away. There are repellents and um, you'd have to research them online. I think the biggest problem with repellents is that if it rains, they get washed off. So you have to apply them a lot. Okay. Um, two people have asked if you'll repeat the name of the book you just mentioned. Um, can you hold on to this? I'm gonna go grab it. I'll be right back. Donna, maybe you can answer this. Have you ever used milk spray to prevent powdery mildew? I have not. I've used neem oil um, for powdery mildew. Okay. Um, and I found that works pretty well as long as I, you know, can get it and it doesn't get washed off by rain right away and that I do it at a time of day when it's not too hot. What about you, Susan? Have you ever used a milk spray to prevent powdery mildew? No, uh, I had never have done that. And my understanding was that the science does not necessarily support its use. But I know that our extension agent has talked about it in programs that she has done. So I would, and she says it's worth trying. Okay. So I would do that. And the name of the book is called Plant Partners. And the author is Jessica Walliser, and it's W-A-L-L-I-S-E-R. I don't know if you can see this. Oh Art. yeah, we can see it well. Okay, that's the book. Okay. Um, someone asks if deer repellents get absorbed into the vegetables. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And um, someone said they're having trouble with white fly on kale and they had to pull up their plants. Is there any other less drastic solution? That's what I had to do. <laughs> yeah, I've used, I've used um, um, insecticidal soap and neem. Um, if you can get at it early before they overtake, um, you can kind of keep it down. Um, if you can't, then it sometimes it just takes it over and it's so gross, you sort of end up. But if you do spray, you need to um, make sure it's not like where it's gonna be in the heat of the day and not gonna get washed off. And then you have to um, make sure you spray under the, the undersides of the leaves and all. No, but I would, I would look at the, uh, but you, you don't, there's things you can do to, to um, keep the population down or maybe down to next to nothing. But once it, if, if, you, if it gets out of hand, it's kind of hard at that point. Um, I've heard suggestions about putting that yellow sticky tape like they use in greenhouses that you can put that near the plant and that'll attract some of them and you can get them out of the garden that way. Oh. But again, um, and there are, there are um, um, paradisoids and predators that will eat um, white fly. Uh, lady beetles, I think, eat white fly. Oh, good to know. But if you plant plants that attract those um, near your um, kale, that might help. Okay. Um, and finally, do you, are there any sprays that prevent or deal with blight, early blight? No, I have early blight on my tomatoes because I can't rotate and so I have to plant my tomatoes in the same place every time. And so what I do is a couple of things. I always try to plant at least one resistant variety, but then I mulch really, really heavily and try not to water from overhead because blight is a soil borne disease. And what happens is when it rains, it bounces up, the spores bounce up on the leaves of the plant and that's how it gets it. And you can also um, cut off the bottom branches of your tomatoes. So when my tomatoes um, start to produce fruit and, the, and I, I start clipping the bottom branches off and as they turn yellow, I keep doing, doing that. And even though I have the blight, I've usually managed to get a crop all the way um, into the fall. Oh, good, good tips. All right, that's good for the questions for now. All right, I'm gonna talk fast. I'm gonna talk New York fast. Um, okay, so we've gone through planting. We've talked about how to take care of your plants and, and, um, and water them. We've talked about weeding so that um, your plants aren't competing with weeds. And we've talked about if you do have problems with um, pests or um, diseases, 
um, or you can go for resources to kind of figure out what to do. So let's talk about the best part, which is harvesting. So let's talk about when to harvest. Now, hopefully you have a journal. Now, maybe it's a paper journal or maybe it's something on your phone, um, but you've recorded the germination and the maturity time for whatever you've planted, um, whether it's a transplant or seeds, just because it's kind of helpful to know um, when you go to the garden, um, are we getting close? Um, for certain kinds of um, vegetables, um, you, 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 um, um, you choose to, you, you um, harvest differently. So for greens like lettuce, sometimes you might grow a head lettuce. And so then you would actually um, cut off the whole, um, the whole lettuce head off, whether it's an iceberg or some of the other uh, more um, modern nutritious varieties or even like romaine, or you can choose to uh, harvest the um, small or large leaves, it depends. And if you send your plants out, you'll definitely get larger leaves. If you, if you let your plants stay kind of close, like I did um, kale one year, and instead of thinning it out to 12 inches, I left them a couple inches apart. So I had pretty much baby kale all, all season as I was growing it because I didn't give it enough space, but that was kind of fun because I had a lot of little tender kale leaves. Um, soybeans and peas, you don't want to harvest them until the, the pod is filled out. And so you want to feel the pod and um, you could take one and open it and see it's typically what will happen in my experience is that you think it's big enough and it's not. What you want to see is sort of the ripples in the, in the um, pod. And that kind of starts to show you that the um, seed is actually is filling out and, and getting to a worthwhile size. But you can always take one and, and look. Um, beans is the opposite unless you're growing them for, for dried beans. Typically, you don't want you want the pod to get to the size like if it's supposed to be a six or a seven inch blue lake um, string bean but you don't want the bean to start to form, um, the plant to form beans inside the pie because typically then it's, it's getting older and it's not gonna be as uh, tender. Interesting thing about tomatoes is um, anytime there's a break in the color from green, if you look in our, um, the tomato class that Colleen and I taught, we have a really good chart on that that shows you the sort of stages of color for a, um, a tomato. And um, if you take, um, once it's got a little bit of color in it, um, you can take it and um, put it on the table in the kitchen. It doesn't need to be in the sun. And over the next few days, it'll totally ripen or put it on a tray. Um, exception to that is cherry and grape tomatoes. They don't, they don't really ripen quite as well. They're a little bit better off um, um, letting them ripen on the plant if you can. The taste, um, you, you lose very little um, flavor and taste doing that. And the reason it's helpful to do that is um, Chipmunks and rabbits and, and, and birds will often um, go after your tomatoes. And, and it, you can look at it one day and say, I'm going to pick it tomorrow. It's going to be perfect. And you come back and they, they've pecked the plant or made a hole in it or eaten half of it and thrown the rest on the ground. Um, and so you're better off picking it then. Um, if I have a, a tomato that's on the, on the plant and it's got some, um, some little peck marks in it, I will often take it home. And, and, and if it's ripe enough, I'll cut off the part that, you know, the half that they, um, played with a little bit and I'll eat the other half. Um, not everybody is comfortable doing that. Um, but definitely, and if you're gonna have a lot of rain and your tomatoes are getting close to ripe, you really be better off um, harvesting them at that point because um, the, a lot of times the skin um, will split because they get so full of water and then they don't last as well because they start to um, go bad. Uh, peppers, it depends upon the variety. Um, it takes a long time for a pepper to get green to red. So you have to be patient. Um, both tomatoes and peppers in this area, um, when the temperatures get over 90 during the day and the nighttime temperatures are well over 70 at night, they just slow down and you'll have a plant filled with green tomatoes or filled with, you know, green peppers and they're just not ripening and they will, they're not going to rot on the plant, but you just got to give it time because once the temperatures start to go down, you'll see that they'll pick up and they'll do better. Um, Summer squash, um, so zucchini and yellow squash, typically you pick them when they're around six inches long. Um, you know, it's easy for them to grow boat size. It's the kind where it goes from your fingertips to your elbow and they can be five pounds. They're still edible, but what you'll wanna do is you'll need to take the seeds out because the seeds will now be uh, much more formed and not, not tender. Um, and you can um, cook them slightly, stuff them with all kinds of good things and they're fantastic. You'll get a three, four meals out of that, three, four servings. Um, winter squash, they start to turn um, color like butternut starts to get more of that like kind of tannish um, brownish color and the stem will get dry where it's attached to the, um, to the squash itself. Uh, root vegetables, things like um, carrots and beets, um, you can feel around at the base of the greens and, um, and kind of feel like what the top of the vegetable um, is feeling like. Um, you can pick one. 
Um, sometimes so you'll be a little bit surprised. You can't always tell by the size of the greens that are that are growing out of it. Sometimes the greens look really um, healthy and big, and then you, you look and it's it's kind of small and you wish you had left it a little longer. So use your judgment a little bit. Those um, references at the bottom have all kinds of really good information for like the whole slew of vegetables and, and when to harvest them. In terms of harvesting practices, um, it's really nice if you can harvest um, early in the day because as the day goes on, things will dry out. And if you harvest it and let it sit, you'll get um, less sweetness as the carbs in the vegetable um, break down, you'll get less um, weight. Um, so if you can do that as soon as you harvest, I, I, I can, if I can't get away from the garden right away, I, I put it in some kind of a, um, a cooler or something to protect it from the heat a little bit. I tend to make uh, harvesting the last thing I do if I go to the garden in the morning rather than um, harvest and then do a whole bunch of other stuff. I try to make it the last thing. Then you take it home, you rinse it, and um, it'll come right back, even if the lettuce looks a little wilted. You rinse it nicely, wrap it in a little bit of damp paper towel and put it in a vegetable drawer and it'll, it'll be perfect and last for a couple of weeks. You wanna prevent wounds. So what you want to do is um, um, not tear at the plant and not um, um, cause damage to the plant. So if you're picking um, beans, for instance, um, you're gonna to wanna to take one hand and hold the plant and use the other hand to pick. Otherwise you're gonna find that you're gonna tear a bunch of flowers off that would be um, more beans or peppers off. And some plants like peppers and tomatoes, sometimes it's easy to um, damage them or, or squash. If you damage any um, vegetables, you could put them in the trash or you can put them in the, in the compost pile. Um, that way you'll get volunteer tomatoes possibly next year. Um, I shouldn't have to say this, but don't put heavy tomatoes on top of the tender tomatoes or tender vegetables. So if you have a squash, definitely put it on the bottom of your harvest basket, not on top of the tomatoes, because you'll just damage them and they'll be split um, and then cool them quickly. A lot of things like tomatoes, peppers, tomatoes, um, if you continue to uh, harvest, you'll get continued production because the plant will put out more flowers. So some tips, um, kales, uh, spinach, lettuces, um, Harvest the outer leaves. You can cut them. Sometimes you can just snap them off um, and then the plant will continue it from the center and it'll continue to grow tall. Again, like I said, zucchini, tomatoes, beans. If you keep harvesting, you'll get continued growth. I have a pair of um, small shears and larger shears um, so that I can go in and easily cut without tearing. I mean, a lot of times you think you can take a zucchini and just twist it and have it come off. And the next thing you know, you break off the Part of the plant at the top of the plant and so then it's 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 got an open area and it just might not um, last as well so again use one hand and um, pick with the other to not break the plant lastly we talked about thinning and how it's a pain to thin but if you do thin the radishes or the kale seedlings or the carrot greens um, as you should you can just eat them in the garden wash them off or you can um, use them as take them home um, rinse them and um, use them as a garnish on um, sandwiches and salad. And you know, the radish greens taste just like a radish. We do that a lot with the kids in the garden when we have the school garden and it's a lot of fun for them because they're surprised that the greens taste like a radish. Um, so any questions there? Uh, yes, we have a few to finish up things. A couple referring back to earlier in the presentation. Is it okay to use a straw left over from last year as mulch this year? Yeah, I do. I tend to actually cover my straw up so it doesn't get too wet over the winter. And yeah, you can use it. Um, the whole point of straw is it's a natural material. It'll keep the weeds down and then it'll, um, it'll break down and add organic matter to the soil. So that's fine. And is it okay to use shredded paper as mulch? Um, I use it more on my compost as a brand, but um, you can, I'll tell you the only problem is it tends to blow. It doesn't really stay in place and um, it can make a mess, um, which means if you have any kind of a, you know, neighbors or a community garden, it's, it may not stay. It's, it's, and it doesn't really add I think you're better off using a more natural, um, natural material, but. Okay. Know. And finally, what does cool vegetables quickly and thoroughly mean? I mean, I take things home, I rinse them and I get them in the fridge, you know, for things that need to go into the fridge. Yeah. Especially the lettuces and stuff like that. They'll look terrible. Like you, you pick them and by the time you get them home, if you, you know, if the garden's not right outside your house and it's, you know, 10 minutes away or something, sometimes they already start to look you know, terrible and, and wilty, but I just throw them in a, in a big bowl filled with cold water and I rinse them and get them clean. And then I just put them in a bag in a paper towel that's damp and they perk right up. Okay. 
And someone asked about using last year's rake partially decomposed leaves for mulch. I assume you'll say that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. That's good on questions. All right. We have a little bit more. So folks can stick with us. I think we're touch. Oh, oh we are over. Shoot. Okay. So here's all the nine steps that we covered. So hopefully if you came to both sessions, you got the first part. Otherwise you can go look at the video for that. I wanted to talk about a couple things just to make you aware of them. You're not going to be an expert on them, but one thing to think about is crop rotation. And so um, Susan talked about that a little bit, but if, if you have plants that belong to the same family and you keep planting plants in that same area and you've had a problem there, they could be susceptible to um, the diseases that you got there before or the pests. The other thing is if, if plants like tomatoes and, and um, say peppers are a heavy feeder and they use a lot of nitrogen and you put plants back there again, um, that are tomatoes and peppers, they may not have the nitrogen that you need there unless you, you, you're adding some to it. But if you put something like a legume, like a bean or a pea that adds that, that um, recovers nitrogen and adds it to the soil, um, then that plant, that area is becoming enriched with nitrogen. And so then a year or two later, you're better off putting a heavy feeder there. So you talk about three to four year rotations. It's kind of hard to do in a small home garden. So what we talk about is at the very least trying not to um, put the same thing in the same place year after year. Um, but I will tell you, my mom um, in New York did this tomatoes in the same place year after year, and they were beautiful every year. So this is what's recommended, but see what happens for you um, in your practice. And there's a good reference at the bottom on doing crop rotation. And here's just a simple, like these are some of the families that you could think about. So you think of legumes or peas and, and beans, then you could follow that say with um, some root vegetables. And then you could follow in there with some of the leaves and the brassica. Things like lettuce and, and radishes can kind of, um, they can kind of fit in in a lot of places. They're not such heavy feeders. And so they're kind of okay. One of the problems we have is some of the fruit vegetables are the ones we really like to grow like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers and summer squash. And so the problem is it's hard to do the rotation because that's one of the things you want to have a lot of. Like my garden tends to be 50% those things, if not more. So it's, it's a little hard to do the rotation, but I want you to be aware of, of that idea. The last thing is um, taking, your, taking your garden to the next level is cover crops. Um, we talked about you know, overwintering and covering with, with plastic, but then we also have this idea of needing to improve uh, Virginia's clay soil. So if you can um, plant some kind of cover crop in the fall, and let it over winter and then plan on cutting it down in the spring. You do a couple things, you keep the weeds down, you um, enrich the soil, you gain some organic matter in the soil and um, you keep the soil from eroding. Um, so the picture on the, on the left is some um, mature uh, clover and, and uh, crimson clover and oats that I grew a couple of years ago. And it was just before I was gonna cut it down, you need to let it get all the way to the point of flowering so that the plant life cycle is done. Then you cut it down and you, you you gently um, till it under and you can um, uh, plant in it um, shortly thereafter. You just have to wait for it though to get to that point. And the problem is it won't get to that point until late April, early May, so that wherever you plant that stuff is, is more areas that you're gonna plant um, warm weather stuff. You won't be able to do early spring stuff there. The middle picture is uh, I planted some winter rye and it's ready there. It's got pollen um, seed heads with pollen on it. But if you look to the right there, I cut it down and that green will um, dry out in a week or two. And then I can use that like I would use a straw, but I leave the roots, I cut it down right at the um, soil surface and I leave the roots to decompose and that just adds organic matter. And I found that that's helped me some with my soil pH and dropping it. And um, it's great for creating a real um, a friable soil. We talked about that earlier and there's some uh, links there to find out more. And just to summarize, um, so here we are in March. Um, it's a good time to repair your soil. We talked about that. Um, and to start your seedlings indoors and to think about any cold weather crops, whether you're going to go off and buy it. But at this point, you'd probably buy transplants because it might be a little too late to try to grow your own. And then what we're going to do for the rest of the year, we talk about the Mother's Day rule for some of the warm weather uh, crops like tomatoes and peppers. But you can gamble and, and start earlier and just be prepared to protect them. Um, and so this is just sort of the nominal schedule and it's repeated on the back of the chart that we gave you on um, the purple and green one with um, some of the growing times for um, vegetables. The back has some of these uh, tasks. Uh, for folks that are outside the Northern Virginia area, um, here's a link to find your local cooperative extension office so that you can get expert advice from them. Um, if you wanna find out more about your own plant hardiness zone, that's the middle link. 
And then the last one has lots of good pictures and um, information um, about hardiness zones, first, last frost, and, and climate um, for across the country. So those are all really good links for both us and folks outside the area. Our whole presentation is based on these best management practices, this idea of testing the soil, understanding what um, your soil, uh, the characteristics of your soil and what you might need to do to improve it. Importantly, this whole idea of the right plant in the right place. If you have a soil that's retaining water, planting a root kind of uh, vegetable like a potato or a radish um, or beets or carrots might not work so well um, because they could rot. Or if you have a really rocky soil, um, carrots might struggle, especially if you try to grow those 10 inch long ones because they can't get down through your soil. So you want to think about what's the right thing to grow and can you find a variety maybe that's shorter and fatter or can you um, improve your soil? And then lastly, um, the idea of, of um, you know, identifying the insects and the weeds. And we're not expecting you to come out of this being expert on that. What we're trying to do is give you an awareness and so that then you have resources. And at the very least, you can email our help desk and send them examples of what you found and, and ask for help. So don't, don't feel overwhelmed by this. This is just to make you aware enough so that you know where to go to get help. And here's the link, here's the email link so that you can go to the help desk. Um, the free virtual classroom, we've mentioned a couple of things that um, We've taught, if you're interested in cover crops, um, I taught a fall uh, class last year that talked about uh, winter gardening and, um, and cover crops and overwintering. And so you can look at that to get more information. And then um, you'll get an email link um, to a survey. And if you uh, fill it out, that will give us some information on what we could do to make the class better um, when we offer it again in the future. And lastly, always wanna give you um, places to go to get help. Between the Rows is really good. That's where you can find all the monthly information on bugs and monthly information on, on things to do in detail. Uh, the Vegetable Gardening Online Resources um, is a whole lot of um, uh, information um, across the, the web. And the same with the Master Gardener Virtual Classroom. That's all these different classes we've taught. Somebody was asking about growing in the Hell Strip. Well, there's an edible landscaping class that will focus on that totally. And that's it. Okay, uh, no questions, but many, many thanks. You'll see in the chat box for a great presentation. You two covered a very dense topic and uh, we're all looking forward to having better vegetable gardens this year. Thank you. Good, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody.